for flight three of Starship. Anybody two? Go. Stage one? Go. Stage two? Go. Flight directors, go for launch. Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Let us know what you like and support us on Patreon so we can keep bringing you great lessons on space science. We have seen many firsts in the space industry over the last few years, and more than a few lasts. This is the last flight of the Delta IV Heavy. The Delta family of rockets goes back to 1960 and were modified forms of the Thor ICBM. The Thor was America's first operational ballistic missile, capable of carrying a thermonuclear warhead. These were almost 20 meters tall, had a mass of 49,590 kilograms, and a range of 2,820 kilometers, reaching an apogee of 630 kilometers. These were kerosene and liquid oxygen burning single-stage rockets. Liquid-fueled rockets have the highest efficiency, but can be temperamental. The Thor had a 24% failure rate and was quickly replaced by the more dependable Atlas hypergolic rocket, which was then itself replaced by the solid-fueled Minuteman system, still on active alert today. The Thor was then improved and became the first stage of a four-stage system called Thor Delta, and then later just Delta. These were used for space probes and satellites with 11 out of 12 successful launches. The kerosene-fueled Delta went through almost an entire alphabet of improvements, going from A through N, ending with the Delta N6 in 1972. Delta rockets were also labeled as Series 1000 through 5000. By the 1980s, the Delta II had been developed, using the RS-27A RP-1 and liquid oxygen gas generator engine, which could produce just over one meganewton of thrust at high altitudes. It had two Vernier engines to control the vehicle roll in flight. The sea level thrust was about 890 kilonewtons. If we divide that by 9.81 or just 10 to get a quick estimate, we can turn that into metric tons force. Then assuming a thrust to weight ratio of 1.5, we can take off one third and get a good estimate of launch mass. In this case, about 60 metric tons with that single engine. Delta II included the 6000 through 7000 series before being replaced with the Delta III. Now when I say replaced, there is usually an overlap, during which the smaller payload rocket is still used for certain missions. The Delta III was the 8000 series, which had a new cryogenic hydrogen-fueled stage above the RP-1 booster. The new stage used the RL-10 engine, which is still the most efficient operational rocket engine ever flown. The hydrogen fuel tank was 4 meters in diameter and used insulation, just like the space shuttle's main tank. The Delta III hydrogen fueled stage was made by Mitsubishi using technology developed for Japan's H-2 rocket system. Then came the 9000 series Delta IV and replaced it with a 5 meter diameter liquid hydrogen fueled booster that used the RS-68 rocket engine. The RS-68 was made as a simpler, more affordable version of the RS-25 Space Shuttle main engines. The Space Shuttle engines were amazingly efficient and are now used on the SLS. These engines used an expander cycle axial flow pump spinning at just over 5,000 RPM to start the oxidizer flow. This pump is powered by a six-stage turbine which is fed high-pressure oxygen from the high-pressure oxygen turbo pump. This boosts the pressure of the liquid oxygen from 0.7 to 2.9 megapascals, which is 100 to 420 psi, going into the high pressure pump, with this line coming off to keep the liquid oxygen tank pressurized. The high pressure pump system has two centrifugal pumps, one for the preburner and one for the main pump. The main pump spins at over 28,000 RPMs, producing over 23,000 horsepower or 17.34 megawatts. The hydrogen system also has an axial flow low pressure pump, driven by a two stage turbine, to provide high pressure liquid hydrogen to the high pressure fuel turbo pump. The low pressure pump is powered by gasified hydrogen, like an expander cycle engine, 
which is what the RL10 is, with a line coming off to keep the hydrogen tank pressurized here. The high pressure fuel turbo pump is a three stage centrifugal pump spinning at over 35,000 RPM. It boosts the liquid hydrogen pressure up to 45 megapascals, which is over 6,500 psi. You will notice that the high pressure hydrogen fuel pump is much bigger than the high pressure oxygen fuel pump to compensate for the lower density of the liquid hydrogen. The oxidizer to fuel ratio is about 6 to 1 for these engines, while the density difference is 17.6 to 1 ending up with a fuel pump almost three times bigger than the oxidizer pump. I mention all this because the space shuttle main engine is very powerful, matching a Raptor 2, and more efficient than any Raptor can be, as this is determined by fuel choice. But what the space shuttle main engine was not was cheap. At over $100 million per engine, it is a Ferrari and not a Ford. To address this issue, the Rocketdyne company that makes the RS-25 also created the RS-68. The RS-68 is the hydrogen-fueled rocket engine that powers the Delta IV. The Delta IV was built as part of the Air Force's evolved, expendable launch vehicle program. The RS-68 is a lot more like the Apollo-era F-1-fueled rocket engines than it is the extremely efficient but complicated RS-25. The RS-68 has 80% fewer parts and is much cheaper. Here we see a diagram of the engine. Here is the high pressure helium spin line to get the pump started. The RS-68 uses a single gas generator shown here. And here we see the oxidizer valve and the fuel valve that releases propellants into the gas generator. Think of a gas generator as a small combustion chamber without a nozzle. This one feeds hot gas into these two turbines, one for the oxidizer and one for the fuel. The turbines spin the pumps that provide high pressure propellant to the engine. The 20 Kelvin cryogenic hydrogen fuel cools the combustion chamber, but not the nozzle. To simplify the engine and reduce cost, the RS-68 uses a blade of nozzles, meaning they have a lining that burns away like a heat shield. The liquid oxygen tank is pressurized from a line here after it goes through this heat exchanger. The hydrogen fuel tank is pressurized from a feed off the combustion chamber cooling shroud. The liquid oxygen and now gasified hydrogen are mixed here and ignited. Ignition is accomplished by an electrically fired solid propellant igniter, much like a model rocket motor. The combustion chamber has a pressure of 10.3 megapascals, which is just over 100 bars, about one-third of a Raptor engine, but produces a thrust of 3,370 kilonewtons, or 758,000 pounds, which stomps even the Raptor 3 in power output. And with its hydrogen fuel, the RS-68 is more efficient at 412 seconds than again any Raptor can possibly be. One of these engines lifts the common core in a Delta IV. The Delta IV has a launch mass of almost 250 metric tons, which is much less than the 550 metric tons of the Falcon 9 full thrust. But the Delta IV can still get almost 11.5 metric tons to low Earth orbit. It was launched from both Vandenberg and Cape Canaveral lifting many GPS and classified military satellites into orbit. It also sent the Parker Solar Probe on its way to the sun. The Delta IV Medium could use strap-on boosters to increase payload to orbit, lifting 12.8 metric tons to LEO. But once SpaceX started flying the Falcon 9, it was hard to compete. The Falcon 9 can lift 22.8 metric tons expendable, which all Delta IV rockets are. In reusable mode, the Falcon 9 can still get 17.5 metric tons to LEO if it lands the booster on a barge. Three Delta IV common cores could be combined to make the Delta IV heavy, which could lift 28.8 metric tons to low Earth orbit, beating the Falcon 9, but not the Falcon Heavy. The Falcon Heavy can lift almost 64 metric tons to LEO and send 16.8 on its way to Mars. The Delta IV could not compete, and this was the last launch. Now to the updates discussed by Elon Musk in SpaceX's latest announcements. The fourth flight of the Starship rocket system is scheduled for May at this time, pending FAA launch licensing. That would be less than two months after Flight 3, dramatically increasing the pace on these flights. We all know how the first three went. Flight 1 tore up the pad. The Starship could not separate, the vector control systems were blown up, and the entire rocket system spun out of control demonstrating the extreme durability of steel. The flight termination system detonated, 
but failed to destroy the rocket in a timely manner. Everything finally went boom when we had Flight 2. Flight 2 did not destroy the pad, and separated smoothly using hot staging. It is important to recognize the flexibility and talent of SpaceX engineers. We have not seen this level of rapid development and testing since the days of Apollo. Hot staging was invented by brilliant Soviet engineers. And Atlas rockets used what was called retrograde staging, where the first stage would continue firing while the upper stage ignited and separated. But no American rocket system had ever used true hot staging until now. On the second flight, the booster blew up while relighting its engines to boost back, and the Starship, while on its way to re-entry, caught fire and was destroyed by the flight termination system. The third flight also hot staged perfectly, with the booster surviving the boost back burn but losing control and exploding about one kilometer above the ocean. While the Starship survived to re-entry, but with an uncontrolled roll that contributed to it breaking up during this phase. At each step, there have been significant improvements. Elon Musk announced many of these to the Starship system, including a more powerful Raptor variant called the Raptor 4. So in terms of performance, we've made um, dramatic progress on, on every level for Starship. Uh, it's remarkable that uh, we can see the Raptor engines and how, how, it, how it has evolved from, you know, optimistically 185 tons to 280. And I think ultimately we'll probably, the booster engines, will we'll aim to get the booster engines over 330 tons of thrust. A total of over 100 meganewtons. That means it could lift over 7,000 metric tons at a thrust to weight ratio of 1.5. More power means less time in gravity drag and more overall lifting capacity. Some people have been critical of what the recently flown starships could get to orbit now. I don't think this matters. Right now they are going heavy for rapid development and testing. Once they get things reusable, they will work on refinement. If the announced version of Starship can get just 3% of its mass to orbit, that would be over 200 metric tons, with a fully reusable rocket system. Nothing else comes close. Now we always get some blowback when we compare SpaceX rockets to other systems. America has started dividing itself into competing factions, where Elon Musk is either the savior of humanity or a complete scam artist with no redeeming accomplishments. Try not to fall into this dichotomy. We can appreciate what the man has accomplished without idolizing his behavior or opinions. It is popular today to look back through history and criticize everyone from our modern perspective. Just remember, our own false beliefs and prejudices will be as obsolete as the Delta IV to our descendants on other worlds. Something to think about. Stay safe and have a great week. At Astra Proterra. Hello, fellow space scholars. I wanted to thank you for being here. This channel started four years ago for many reasons. One of them is that I love to teach and have always wanted to learn how to create video lessons. Another was my frustration at the lack of facts in space news. I wanted to make sure that those truly interested in space science had somewhere to go to learn about the equations that make rockets possible, to give you the tools to make your own evaluations of different launch systems. But as important as understanding the equations are, they limit my channel to those with a serious interest in understanding space science. As many of you know, the YouTube algorithm promotes broad topics that are easy to understand. Our space science lessons, however, require a more detailed understanding, and I don't want to dumb the lessons down. But that makes the target audience a lot smaller. To take this channel to the next level will require that I invest more time and resources, and that will require your help. Therefore, I really need your support via Patreon or YouTube membership. Just a little bit every month can make a huge difference, and would be greatly appreciated. I thank you so much, dear friends of Rocket Technology, for your continued support, and I can't tell you how much it means to me. Thank you, and stay safe. Ad Astra Proterra.
So what I was gonna, what, what I'm going to go through to tonight is the overall overall sort of path to making life multiplanetary. So um, we're doing a lot of good things at SpaceX. I mean, Starlink is incredible, providing connectivity throughout the world, um, and also, you know, paying for a lot of what we're doing here. And uh, Falcon 9 is the, the primary lift vehicle, launch vehicle for, for Earth, it just doing more non-SpaceX launches than anything else. And, uh, but Starship is what is, will, will Starship, Starship is the first design of a rocket that is actually capable of making life multiplanetary, um, where success is one of the possible outcomes. Uh, no rocket before this has had the potential to extend life uh, to another planet. And, um, uh, and I'll, I'll sort of wax esoteric here for a minute, because um, this, this may sound sort of uh, unusual, but when you think about the question of where are the aliens, um, which I get asked a lot, um, this is like the Fermi paradox, where are the aliens? And um, I've not seen any evidence that there are aliens on Earth. A lot of people think there are aliens on Earth, and I'm like, great, I'd like to meet one. Um, you know, for a while there, when I was getting my green card and everything, it said alien registration card. I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, but uh, this, this question of where are the aliens is, uh, I think, a very profound one. Because uh, we're, I'm aware of no evidence of aliens whatsoever. Which means that I think we're probably alone. Um, and <clears throat> if you look at the history of Earth, like how long has Earth been around? If, assuming that physics is correct, uh, the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. Uh, Earth is about four and a half billion years old. When you f think about the how, lo how old is civilization, I think the, the right measuring point for civilization, in my view, or, or a, a good measuring point, would be the advent of writing. So the first writing uh, is generally considered to be the ancient Sumerians. Uh, where are they now? They died out. But the, about 5,500 years ago, it was archaic pre-cuneiform. Pre in fact, I suggest um, it's like an interesting rabbit hole to uh, read about the history of writing. Um, so if you consider, say, like, okay, civilization, I think if you don't have writing, you kind of need writing for civilization. So, um, so it's only been around for like a little over 5,000 years. Out of four and a half billion years that Earth has been around and the 13.8 billion years of the universe. So we're, all of human civilization is basically the blink of an eye. It's like a, just a fraction, it's, almost, it's nothing. Um, and I think that, that probably means that, that consciousness is incredibly rare. Um, and perhaps fleeting. It may not last for very long. Because um, otherwise, we would have, I think we would have seen aliens, some kind of sign of aliens. I think the most likely explanation is that consciousness is, is uh, so rare that, that you, 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 it, and, and does that consciousness actually extend to another planet? Does that consciousness extend to uh, another star system. I mean, ultimately, if we're able to become a, a space-faring civilization, a multi-planet species, and ultimately a, a multi-stellar species, and go out there and explore all these star systems, I think we may find that there are many long-dead one-planet civilizations. Um, we, and as you've heard me say before, we don't want to be one of those lame one-planet civilizations. I mean. We want to be a multi-planet civilization, ultimately be a multi-stellar civilization, be out there among the stars. Like, you know, make science fiction, not fiction, forever. Um, kind of make Star, Star Trek real. Um, that's, uh, so that's why I think that there's, there's, there's a high urgency to making life multi-planetary. Um, 
because this is the first time in Earth's four and a half billion year history that it's been possible to extend life or consciousness beyond Earth. And we've got to do that while civilization is still strong. So that's, that's, that's the overarching goal of the company, is extend life sustainably to another planet. Mars is the only option, really. And uh, to do so, uh, ideally, bef before World War III, or some kind of bad thing. The, the key thing is that we, we need enough people and enough tonnage on Mars, uh, such that Mars can survive and continue consciousness uh, even if something would happen to Earth. Um, now, I still think, well, obviously, we, 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 I'm not talking about ab abandoning Earth or anything like that, and we want Earth to be as good as possible for as long as possible, but there are certain things that may be outside of our control. So, so we want to just get, get uh, Mars to be a self-sustaining civilization as quickly as possible. And I, I think this can be done in around 20 years. So, and this, this you know, giant Starship factory that we're building is obviously key to that. And the launch sites that we're building here and at, and at the Cape and elsewhere in the future will be key to that. So, and congratulations, guys. You did that. That's, in, that's insane. I mean, it looks like CGI. Um, I mean, it's hard to believe that that is unfiltered video. That's just the actual what the camera saw. No filters, no nothing. That's actually what the camera saw, which is insane. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, you're doing incredible work that I think uh, almost no one thought would actually happen. So, uh, it's wild that, that this, uh, this strange spot, this, we're, we're basically on a sand spit uh, by the Rio Grande, near the beach. Um, and. Uh, that is actually the gateway to Mars. Um, has to be like, if, if this was a movie, you'd be like, no way. <laughs> Come on. Too, too implausible, but it's, it's real. And it's due to you guys. Congratulations. This is a side by side of the three flights. You can see our thruster weight improved significantly. So we've, um, we've made tremendous progress from flight one to flight two to flight three. And we've got uh, flight four coming up in about a month or so. And uh, with flight four, we should, uh, if we get, you know, if fate smiles upon us, uh, we'll get through the high heating regime um, and uh, s smash into the ocean at a controlled spot. Um, and then uh, hopefully be able to also do this with the, with the booster, uh, land on a, essentially a virtual tower. Um, if, if the landing on the virtual tower with the booster works, then we will actually try with Flight 5 to come back and land on the tower. Yeah. That, that, that's very much a success-oriented schedule, but... Uh, <laughs> But it is in the realm of possibility. Um, but I would say like, the, the odds of us actually being able to catch the, the booster with the Mechazilla arms this year, I think, I don't, I don't want to tempt fate, knock on wood, but I think the odds of actually catching the booster uh, with the tower, probably like 80, 90% this year, um, which is insane. Like actually, when we first talked about it, it sounded so, Bat shit crazy. <laughs> We're going to have a giant, it's like literally bigger than Megazilla from this movie. <laughs> uh, that you would catch like, the, like the, the biggest flying object ever made with mechanical arms out of the air. But we're going to do it. So, it's good. yeah. It may not work, you know, necessarily the first time, but it, you know, it will work. Um, so really, a starship is, is really the key to making life multiplanetary and preserving the light of, light of consciousness. That's what it's all about. And um, it, it may end up being the most important thing that, that we ever do. I think that 
you're, you're with, like the light of consciousness is like this, this tiny candle in a, in a vast darkness. And th that candle has only been lit for a very short time and it could easily go out. So we obviously want to preserve that, that, the tiny light of consciousness on Earth, but extend it to Mars and then ultimately to the rest of the solar system and then s start going to other, other star systems. And um, I mean, I won't be alive to see that, but unless I'm like frozen or something, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I, th I think at some point we will discover many civilizations that maybe lasted a million years or two million years or 10 million years. Um, but a civilization that lasted a million years, which, which would be, you know, vastly longer than our civilization has lasted. I mean, th that's only the, th the third decimal point, so like 13.8 billion something something years. If, you're, if your civilization lasts a million years, it only goes, that third digit past the decimal point goes up one. <laughs> and that's a million years. So, I mean, I'd say, like we should think of like, how do we make civilization last a million years? You know, we often get caught up in like the day-to-day -day things, but we want to have at least a million year civilization, if not a hundred million year civilization, or a billion year civilization. So, a absolutely crucial to that goal is becoming a multi-planet species. Pe uh, people, often, uh, people often ask why, why Mars? Um, well, there's not a lot of options, frankly. <laughs> so, uh, if, if Venus is a, a superheated, uh, high-pressure acid bath, so not, uh, not what, you don't, don't want to go to Venus. Uh, that, and then um, the moon is close, but it, it, it doesn't have an atmosphere. The gravity is only one-sixth that of Earth, and it's missing a lot of key resources. So uh, also the, 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 the insulating value of the moon relative to Mars is much less. So if there's something that takes out Earth, like let's say there's a World War III, a global thermonuclear warfare, they'll probably throw a few nukes at the moon. <laughs> so, whereas it's way harder to, to, to shoot Mars with, with nuclear, and we'd, Mars would see it coming and probably have some time to stop the inbound missiles. Um, so the, 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 ins, the, the, the value of Mars, the, the, the difficult, or the distance and time required to get to Mars actually has an insulating benefit to the, for the continuation of consciousness, even if there's something terrible happens on Earth. Um, and, uh, and then once we go beyond Mars, there's, there's some asteroids like Ceres, uh, some of the moons of Jupiter. Um, Starship would ultimately be capable of, uh, of reaching anywhere in the solar system. Uh, and then we, we'll need something uh, uh, so a new level of technology to go to other star systems. But if we can at least get to Mars, then other star systems are hopeless. I mean, it's a fixer-upper of a planet. Okay, it needs some work. But it is, uh, it's, it's really the only option for becoming multiplanetary. And long term, we can warm up Mars and we can, there, there would be, we can densify the atmosphere and there'd be a liquid ocean on about 40% of the surface. So we could make it an Earth-like planet uh, long term. So, let's see. Um, we've, we've, we've learned a tremendous amount from when we started the company and, and um, at first could, were unable to get even a small rocket to or orbit to now where we've done three, 327 successful launches uh, almost 300 landings. In fact, you know, give it a few weeks and we'll have done three, 300 landings. Um, 261 reflights. So, uh, I mean, many times I was told that uh, that reusability was it was impossible, and even if you did it, there would there would be no point because nobody would want to fly rockets that much. Um, but now we routinely. Uh, fly and land the booster, and we recover the fairing. So we've learned a tremendous amount from the Falcon program that is then feeding into the Starship program. 
Um, and Falcon and Starlink are what obviously keep, keep the company going. So um, I'd just like to have, give a hand to the, the Falcon team for the incredible work that they're doing. And then Dragon. Wow, 45 launches of Dragon. It's amazing. And we've flown, flown 50 crew members to orbit, 46 to the space station. Um, and uh, everyone has come home safely, which is the most important thing. Um, so, you know, incredible work by the Dragon team. So let's give them a hand. That was, uh, couldn't ask for a better outcome. And Starlink, uh, actually, if you, if you look at the sort of the, pl the plot of the, uh, all the satellites going around Earth, um, this look kind of scary, actually. Uh, but there's, there's 6,000 satellites in operation, oh, over 6,000, and uh, 10,000 lasers, almost 3 million customers. Um, so St Starlink is doing a lot of good for people. Uh, for people on Earth who don't, either don't have internet access or it's very expensive. And uh, so it's doing, doing a lot of good you know, on Earth. Uh, because when, when I say we want to be a multi-planet species, I'm, I, I, you know, we obviously want Earth to be as good as possible and Mars to be, to be great. So uh, Starlink is, is doing a tremendous amount of, of that. And we're learning a lot by having this big fleet. Um, Starlink will also be uh, very important for high bandwidth communication uh, to and on Mars. So, <laughs> from, a, from a tiny rocket to Falcon 9, which is a much bigger rocket, uh, many iterations of Falcon 9, and then Falcon Heavy, and then Starship. And Starship will get bigger. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> um, you know this. This year, we, if if, um, if things go according to plan, uh, SpaceX will do probably ninety percent of all Earth mass to orbit, and then China will do about six percent, and the rest of the world will do about four uh, percent, which is pretty wild. And then once Starship is flying, uh, we'll be doing over ninety-nine percent of all Earth mass to orbit. Um, which you kind of have to do in order to uh, build a city on Mars. And, and I should say, we'll also build a, a, a lunar base as well. So, so it might as well, along the way. <laughs> so you can see that uh, <laughs> actually Falcon 1 was really, yeah, half a ton to orbit. Um, I think we slight error on the slide there. So Falcon 1 was about half a ton to orbit. Uh, Falcon 9, depending on in, in expendable mode, I uh, would do probably 25 tons to orbit. Uh, and uh, yeah, Falcon Heavy, probably 70. Uh, anyway, the, these, these are just uh, obviously rapidly increasing numbers. And Starship in its final configuration or its final form um, will probably do well over 200 tons to orbit w with full reusability um, and be able to fly you know, multiple times a day. So,
So I, I, I'm pretty confident we will achieve that this year. Like I said, probably 80, 90 percent uh, this year. <laughs> and, uh, and then there's recovering and reusing the ship. The ship will take uh, longer. Um, so the ship, I think we'll want to have uh, at least two consecutive successes of a given design uh, that uh, land at a specific point in the ocean or smash into a specific point in the ocean before we try to bring it back to the launch site. Because um, we, do, we do not want to rain debris over uh, Mexico or the US. So uh, my guess is probably next year is when we will be able to reuse Starship. But I think it's, it's, I think it's highly likely that this year we will bring Starship to, or the ship, the ship side of it, to a controlled point in the ocean. Um, and have it basically land on a virtual, uh, virtual tower in somewhere in the in the Pacific or the Indian Ocean. And we've already proven that we can do the final phase of landing. So coming from sort of a belly first position to uh, rotating the ship and landing vertically, uh, we proved that right here. So what, we just really we just need to be confident that we can get through the high heating portion of the app of, of reentry uh, reliably and then we will bring the ship back and it will land on the tower as well and we're going to build more mechazillas so there's going to be two launch towers here and and I think and then two launch towers at the Cape as well uh, so we'll have uh, four launch towers for uh, for starship probably you know by sometime next year so uh, we're aiming to have the first Cape uh, launch tower and launch system operational around the middle of next year. Um, and that'll be important for launch uh, azimuths that are uh, sort of fly over land. Um, <clears throat> so I think we, we, what, what we should probably expect is that we, we do the kind of the development launches here um, test anything new here, build the, build the rockets, and then uh, probably most of the operational launches would be from the Cape. So this year we're planning to build another roughly six uh, boosters and ships. And, um, and that production rate will increase a lot uh, next year. That's why we're building the, the giant factory. Ultimately, we'll need to build a lot more ships than boosters, especially for Mars, because it's at the, you'll actually want to use the ship, take apart the ship and use it for raw materials on Mars, um, because the ship materials will be so valuable. You, mo most of the ships you wouldn't want to bring back. You'd want to just use them for raw materials. Um, eventually, we will want to bring ships back. And I think we want to give people the option of coming back because they're more likely to want to go if there's some option of coming back. Um, but I think most of most of the people that go to Mars will probably never come back to Earth. So, uh, and we'll need to ramp uh, production to pretty high numbers. Like, a, I think ultimately probably a ship every, like, multiple ships per day, basically. Um, and uh, then next year, we're aiming to demonstrate ship-to-ship -ship propellant transfer. Um, it's, it's hard to make this not look a little bit naughty, uh, <laughs> because it's two ships connecting and doing a fluid transfer. It's just what it is. Um, but it is, this is actually a very important uh, and this is a very important step on going to Mars because you need to put to get the ship to orbit and then do orbital refilling, kind of like aerial refueling, and um, and that's that's really you, you'll need about about five or six uh, refilling missions for every one mission that goes to Mars. So roughly five to one. So, and, and this will also be very important for the Artemis program for the NASA to, to get back to the moon. So we'll want to have a ship that is, uh, well, it's going to be a specialized ship for the moon, um, like this. <laughs> um, 
So the moon, obviously, there's no mechazella, so we need la landing legs. And uh, you don't need a heat shield, and uh, you don't need flaps, because there's no atmosphere. So the moon ship would be specialized. Uh, and uh, now ultimately, I think we, we, we want to build a moon base, moon base alpha, um, and have a permanently uh, occupied uh, base on the moon. Like, that would be super exciting. Um, and so you'd have a bunch of ships that are specialized for going to and from the moon, but they never come back to, uh, they never land back on Earth. They just would, would uh, dock with uh, propellant, propellant tankers to get uh, orbital refilling. So, uh, and then the Raptor 3 also will not need a heat shield. So Raptor 3 looks, looks very simple, and it is actually simplified in a lot of ways. Um, but a lot of the complexity is hidden because we have integral cooling channels uh, in, in many parts of the engine that, that don't exist in Raptor 2. So in order to not have a heat shield, it has to be very resilient. Um, but that is actually what Raptor 3 would look like. It looks like Raptor 3 looks like it's missing a bunch of parts. Uh, but actually, those parts have either been deleted or they've been integrated into the system, and like I said, with integral cooling channels. Um, and where you, where you need secondary plumbing, the secondary plumbing has also been integrated uh, into the pump and into the, the chamber jacket. And um, yeah, so it's uh, much simpler. Well, it's, 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 yeah. it's actually extremely difficult to build Raptor 3, but. Um, but it will be easy to integrate and will have higher performance and lower total mass um, and be more reliable. So. That can go on for a while. Um, so I, I find it interesting to look at the, if you look at the, uh, f the flame tail on Starship uh, and how long it is. It's a, it's a very long flame tail, um, which is uh, due to the fact that the, the, the chamber pressure, well, it's, it's just outputting a lot more, yeah, a lot more gas at a higher velocity. Um, but I think the flame tail is like maybe 1,000 feet long. It's like more than twice the length of the rocket. Um, and that will actually get, as, as we increase the thrust, that will get longer. So, yeah. Um, and inevitably, the rocket grows in height. So Starship 2, we're aiming for, like, uh, currently Flight 3 would be around 40 or 50 tons to orbit. Um, uh, so the current design, Starship 2 will be over 100 tons, and then Starship 3 will be over 200 tons. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, going from around 7,000 tons thrust to over 8,000. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll end up ultimately with more than, more than 10,000 tons of thrust, um, probably seven or 8,000 tons of liftoff mass. And at least 10 meters taller, we'll see. <laughs> Tends to grow. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it probably grows a bit more than that, even really. Um, so if you, if you look at Falcon 9, it's, it is very, we're not going to do the length to diameter of Falcon 9. That would be crazy. But uh, Falcon 9 is a very long rocket. Um, and uh, so I suspect it'll probably get a bit longer than this. But at, at 200 tons per flight, Fully reusable. Um, that is that is pretty incredible, and uh, yeah, this will be on the order of 500 feet tall. Um, and then we're there's this there's thousands of design improvements here. So I mean, the, I think maybe the most 
one of the most profound things is Starship 3 will cost less per flight than Falcon 1. So that's the difference between if you've got a fully reusable rocket or an expendable rocket. Um, the fully reusable rocket with low cost propellant and autogenous pressurization uh, actually costs less than a, a, a tiny expendable rocket. So, and it'll do, like I said, Falcon 1 is about half a ton to orbit. The Starship 3 will be 400 times more payload for less than the cost of a Falcon 1. Um, ultimately, I think we, we might be able to get the cost per flight to Earth orbit down around $2 million or $3 million. So, uh, th these are sort of unthinkable numbers uh, from the, you know, no, nobody ever thought that this was possible, but we're not breaking any physics to achieve this. Uh, so this is within the balance, with, without breaking physics, we can do this. So the, the Mars missions are two years apart, or 26 months. Um, and uh, if you look closely at the Starlink router, you see the, the home and transfer from Earth orbit to Mars orbit. And uh, that's basically to, to say to people, the Starlink system that you're buying is helping get humanity to Mars. I think it's pretty cool. So every, roughly every two years, thousands of ships would depart from Earth to Mars. It would look like Battlestar Galactica, but in a good way, you know. Hopefully w without being chased by the Cylons. Um, but I, it would be an incredible thing to see these thousands of ships departing every, every 26 months for Mars. What this diagram is basically saying is that uh, for getting to Mars, we would um, essentially uh, create a kind of a propellant depot ship. The propellant depot would look more like a hot dog than like a spear. Um, it's really just a, a long ship with a lot of insulation. And uh, we'd fill that chip up. And then shortly before, or, or as, as they're going to Mars, the ships would take off with, I don't know, a couple hundred tons of payload from Earth, reach orbit with very, almost no propellant, and then uh, get refilled by the tanker, uh, and then go to Mars and, and land, go all the way to Mars with over 200 tons of useful payload. Then on Mars, in the beginning, we would, I think we would simply reuse the ship materials. So most of the ships wouldn't come back. But then over time, you'd want to bring the ships back so you could reuse them. And, um, and for that, we would need to create uh, methane, CH4, and oxygen O2 on Mars, which you can do with uh, H2O and CO2. So the atmosphere is CO2, and there's plenty of water ice, H2O. And so it's, it's kind of like tailor-made for, well, we actually, the reason we have a methane oxygen system is because you can make methane and oxygen on Mars fairly easily, like not, uh, just not a total walk in the park, but the ingredients are red readily available to create methane and oxygen on Mars. So, so you build a propellant depot and, and bring the ships back and build out as quickly as possible a self-sustaining civilization on Mars. And we want, to get the, we want to get the cost of going to Mars such that almost anyone could afford it. So, like if somebody were to just work hard on Earth, save up, and that they'd be able to go to Mars. So it's like anyone, ideally, almost anyone could go to Mars. And I think you'll see a lot of governments also sponsor people, um, and ultimately we'll, we'll want to get, uh, so there's, uh, kind of an optimal landing zone on Mars where you have resources, so you've got access to water or frozen water, um, that you're not too close to the poles so you can use solar power. Um, it, would, uh, it would be nice to use nuclear. I don't know if we'll get, get the approval, but nuclear would be very handy on Mars because you can use the heat um, and you can generate electricity. So, and then uh, you kind of want to be about two kilometers below sea level. <laughs> so if Mars did have an ocean, you'd actually be quite deep in the ocean, at least at first. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's see. That's Mars, kind of 
you kind of want to land about halfway between the, the pole and the equator um, in, in a kind of a deep area of Mars. If, if, if you, the deeper it is, the more you can use the atmosphere to break, and the atmospheric density is higher. So these are all the things that would have to be developed. Uh, sometimes people ask me, are we developing these things? I'm like, not yet, because uh, this is the cart, and we need the horse first. Um, so the rocket is the horse, and then this is the cart. Uh, but ultimately, we'll need all these things, lots of power generation, mining in general, ice mining, propellant production, long duration life support, uh, a lot of construction, and, uh, and then global communication. Um, so I think this would open up a lot of opportunities for entrepreneurs that want to create any create things on Mars, whether that is a propellant. Well, well I think we'll have to do the propellant depot, but uh, whether it's uh, like iron ore refining or a pizza joint or a bar, you know, uh, there'll be an opportunity to do all the things that we like on Earth on Mars, like a Mars bar would be yeah. <laughs> great. Um, so I, th I think probably the, a rough order of magnitude guess for what you need, how many people do you need for a self-sustaining city is about a million um, and several million tons of, of cargo. So uh, yeah, which we can do and we can do this in 20 years. But like I said, in order for it to be self-sustaining, you actually need the entire base of industry. You can't be missing any element. So that's, that's really what's going to take, take a while is, do you have everything you need to survive on Mars? At that point, the future of consciousness is assured. So if you do 10 launches a day at 200 tons per launch, a uh, million and a half tons to LEO per opportunity, you, you net that out to a quarter million tons uh, to Mars per opportunity. So that means you can get to, to a million tons in about eight years since the opportunities are two years apart. So I think this is pretty doable. And I'm like, we're actually going to do this. Are we just, well, I, you know, we are actually going to do it, which is insane to think. So millions of tons to Mars. Yeah. Wild. Um, and we're going to build a lot of vehicles. So, uh, yeah, several thousand vehicles per year is what we'll need. Which really quite, quite doable, actually. It sounds like a lot, but it's very doable. Yeah, if you compare it to sort of car production, uh, it's, it's a small number. Of course, this is much bigger than a car, uh, but even if you look at the total tonnage, um, the, uh, it's, it's still very, it's very doable to build several thousand vehicles a year. Um, so that's what we need to do, and we're going to do it. And then long term, we'll probably have some offshore launch sites. You can just imagine all of these starships waiting in orbit for the planets to align, and then this gigantic star fleet taking off from Mars.
All right, so we're actually going to do this. Um, and uh, when you think about wh where this started out, this was literally just a, like a, a sandbar um, where we're standing right now. And now look at what we've done here. And uh, we've gotten three flights off of Starship, and we've got a fourth, fourth one coming up. And uh, we're building a gigantic factory that will be able to output a massive number of ships. So it's surreal, but, it, but it's real. Um, so we're actually going to do this. We're going to take humanity to Mars. And uh, I'm confident you can do it. So.